All right, hi, welcome back everybody. Today we're moving on with our marine bio lecture to talk about tetrapods. And uh, what I wanna do quickly, I wanna throw in a little bit of evolutionary biology here because we're gonna skip one of these groups mainly and it kind of messes up the evolutionary story but one of the groups really isn't all that marine. So when we talk about the evolution of tetrapods, one of the big things that comes up in evolution is people question uh, where these intermediate groups are, where's a, an in-between fossil, if you will. And the evolution of fish into amphibians is some of the best evolutionary biology uh, examples that we have because we have so many fossils of these animals because they happen to live in a kind of location where you would expect a lot of fossils to be produced. So we know that by looking at the fossil record, the first vertebrates on land were probably amphibians around 400 million years ago, and they came from the evolution of certain lobed fin fish or lung fish. Um, and we have very good examples of those. And of course, once again, you don't need to know all the fossils and, and all the extinct uh, species that we have, but the point is that that is a very good complete record. And when we talk about amphibians, the word amphibian refers to the fact that they have two lives, uh, which is a, a type of, in reference to the metamorphosis they go through that many frogs go through, they generally have skin that is smooth and moist and they have a lot of cutaneous respiration they breathe through their skin. And really there are no marine amphibians. The closest one is, is probably what they call the marine toad, also called the cane toad, it's from South America. It's probably the most marine of any amphibian, but not really marine in and of itself. So we really won't spend much time in this class talking about amphibians because almost none of them are marine. Uh, but I wanted to kind of mention them because the next group we're gonna go into, the reptiles are, and kind of understanding how the evolutionary scene took place kind of helps us see where the reptiles are going. Now, the big difference that allowed uh, amphibians to change and be turned into reptiles in part and to be able to stay on land and not be required to return to land was the evolution of the amniotic egg. And the amniotic egg is a specialized egg that allows the animal to complete their life cycle on land and it has a shell that helps it retain water. And in some cases that's lost when it's kept say inside mammals as we'll learn later on. And it has these specialized extra embryonic membranes that are really not part of the animal that help the animal survive and develop inside this protective shell and not dry out. And this is what the basic amniotic egg looks like. If you kind of look at a diagram of a chicken egg, that's a type of amniotic egg and that's probably the best example that you're probably most familiar with. Now, when we talk about reptiles, how do reptiles differ from amphibians? Well, they don't have moist, wet skin, but rather it is tough and it's generally very dry skin. And they have this amniotic egg, they have crushing or gripping jaws, so the muscular system in the jaw is better. And they have better lungs, more developed lungs. Many amphibians have very tiny lungs, or, or there's even a group of salamanders that have no lungs whatsoever. So the lungs are better, and they have much better water conservation. And that allows the reptiles, uh, land reptiles, to be able to stay on land. And that's a big starting point. So we're going to start there. We Once again, we have the phylum chordata, we have the subphylum vertebrata, we have superclass nathostomata, and this is kind of right along the same lines as what we did with the fish. We have the class reptilia which are the reptiles. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna do class reptilia, and then I'm gonna call the other ones groups because once again, it's not inaccurate, it's just less specific. And it allows us to keep the word reptilia in there because most people know what that word means when you're talking about it, okay? Everything from here on out is gonna be uh, an amniote of some sort. And you can see scattered throughout here, um, many different kinds of reptiles we'll talk about. And one of the things that's gonna be kind of interesting we'll mention here in a little bit is one of the problems with that class reptilia that people have trouble with is what do you do with birds? Because birds were kind of always their own thing. Well, it turns out that the crocodiles are actually gonna be pretty closely related to birds. And crocodiles are gonna be more closely related to birds than they are 
to snakes and lizards and turtles you see is over here no one's known what to do with turtles uh, for almost ever all right so our first group in the reptiles is the class or as i mentioned before the group testudines or chelonia and these of course uh, are the turtles and tortoises and they have a protective shell i think most people know that the top of the shell is called a carapace the bottom of the shell is called the plastron and they originally evolved on land and returned uh, to water uh, later on evolutionarily. Certain turtles evolved to be more marine and moved back into the ocean. Let's talk about turtles and tortoises in general. Turtles uh, in general first. First of all, turtles have, they have no teeth, uh, but their bill can be quite sharp. And most of them have a what, what's called a temperature dependent sex um, determination system so at low temperatures they tend to produce uh, males and at higher temperatures they pr tend to produce females this is called a type one or a pattern one temperature dependent sex system we'll see later on other animals have a type two uh, there are seven species and most of them are highly endangered or endangered at least seven species. Uh, they're able to migrate thousands of miles in open ocean without being able to see anything. They're one of the only animals that can do this, but they can sense the magnetic field of the earth and determine which direction they need to move based on where they're at, because out in the open ocean, there are no landmarks for them to see. The largest of the sea turtles is the leatherback sea turtle, which you can see in this picture here, they can dive uh, up to 1,000 meters deep. So that's a little bit over half a mile. They can be as large as six feet long and weigh up to 1,000 pounds, and they can hold their breath for several hours. But because they are reptiles, uh, all the reptiles, for the most part, need to resurface to breathe. Uh, and these typically eat sea jellies and other invertebrates. The leatherback sea turtle, some of them migrate like over 10,000 miles, and the biggest threat to them happens to be the fishing industry, and that happens to be what we call bycatch. You're gonna see this term a lot, but what happens is uh, many of the big fishing industry uh, countries have these very large nets that are out in the ocean, and sea turtles get trapped in them, and if they're out there too long, uh, the sea turtle gets trapped in, and they get tangled up in the net like you can see here and they drowned. They need to reach the surface to breathe. Uh, unlike fish that sometimes can survive in the nets for many, many hours, these uh, animals end up dying. And it's called bycatch because it's not really what the target is. Bycatch is simply uh, animals that are caught in nets or in other ways that aren't the intended target and they're just thrown back over. The next sea turtle I'll mention is the green sea turtle. This is the largest of the hard shell turtles and they eat seagrass as adults, although as juveniles they eat invertebrates and they can occasionally be actually seen locally here in Southern California. So at Bolsa Chica, um, the wetlands there or in the local city of Seal Beach are a couple locations where sea turtles are kind of commonly spotted. Okay, next we'll talk about the group called squamata. These are the snakes and lizards. When you think about lizards, most people think, well, they have legs on them, but there are lizards without legs. But the, the sort of distinguishing character is that nearly all lizards have moving eyelids. In our case, there is really only one truly marine lizard, and that is the marine iguana. They're found only on the Galapagos Islands, uh, and they bask on these really warm rocks but then they dive into this really cold water and they actually eat uh, marine algae underwater. So they dive down and actually eat. Uh, mo most iguanas are herbivorous. And so that's what you're seeing is this marine iguana is actually diving into the water and eating the algae off the rocks down below. And they're very good swimmers. Swim down, will eat, and then resurface. Okay, in the same class, so snakes and lizards fall in that same class are the sea snakes. There's several different species of sea snakes. They have bodies that are laterally flattened, typically, that, that help them in swimming. Most of them are highly venomous. They're a, they're a fixed rear fang snake, so they're related to uh, animals such as cobras uh, that are found mainly in parts of Asia 
and Africa and Australia. So they're quite different than the rattlesnakes that we have here. They're a rear fanged, fixed fanged snake. So they don't fold their fangs, not because they're sea snakes, but rather that family of snakes that have those rear fangs tends to be uh, quite uh, venomous. But what's interesting about sea snakes is that they're, they're generally very docile and uh, don't attack people hardly ever. Many of them spend their entire lives in the water. Most of them are oviparous, so they give live birth in the water. They need to resurface to breathe, uh, but they many of them never come on to land, uh, hardly at all. They're found in the Indian Ocean and the Eastern Pacific Ocean. This one, the yellow-bellied sea snake, is one of the uh, one of the largest ones and, and one of the most uh, widespread. Um, here's another one here called a yellow-lipped sea crate. Um, many of them have what's called cutaneous respiration, and they get 25% or so of their respiration through their skin, which is very unusual for reptiles in general because most reptiles with this dry skin don't uh, respirate very well through their skin. But sea snakes are an example where they're an exception to that rule. They do have what's called aposematic coloration. So you'll often see animals that are brightly colored, uh, black and yellow, black and white, very highly contrast. That uh, is a signal to other animals that the animal is venomous. So the opposite of sort of blending in and hiding is aposematic coloration. That's what you see in the sea snakes. Okay, then we have the class Crocodilia. These are, of course, the crocodiles and alligators. And there's really only one marine example of this. Uh, these are the largest living reptiles, and this happens to be the largest of them is the estuarian, or also called the saltwater crocodile. They can get up to 20 feet and weigh 3,000 pounds. Found in the Indian and Eastern Pacific Oceans uh, from parts of India, to Northern Australia and all the uh, islands that are north of Australia, they're Papua New Guinea and so forth. They're not considered endangered. They also have temperature dependent sex, like we mentioned with the uh, turtles, but instead they are a type two temperature dependent sex system where low temperatures uh, will give you females uh, but so will high temperatures. And it's the intermediate, the middle part that gives you males. So that's what you see in the pattern two here. Uh, they hunt by eating prey whole, uh, or what they do with really big prey is they drown it. So one of the unique hunting strategies of really all big alligators and crocodiles, and this is very true for large crocodiles like the estuarian crocodile is they grab something and they drag it in the water and because they're so big and heavy they can grab something uh, like a deer or occasionally even grab people and they just back up into the water and they they because they're reptiles they can hold their breath for a long time and they just simply drown it uh, because they're so big it's like being grabbed by a car that just backs up and goes into the water we don't have them in the United States, so you don't have to worry about that. But there are places in Australia where I've been and you're out swimming and then you're like, hey, is there crocodiles here? So they are, they're found in estuaries, but they do go out into the open ocean as well, okay? Next, we have the class Aves, the last one we're gonna talk about today. Those are the birds, of course. And birds typically have hollow bones and what that means is that, that they're honeycombed. There are spaces inside that makes them lighter. They have feathers, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. They have wings, and they are endothermic. And this is probably the first time we've mentioned this. Endothermic means they produce most of their own body heat through their metabolism, which is what mammals such as us do as well. So they don't have to go sit out on the rocks, kind of like the marine iguana I was just talking about. They have reduced organs, like they're missing a urinary bladder, and they tend to have one ovary. Um, they're missing their teeth. They don't have teeth. So all these are adaptations to make them lighter to help them fly. And they have a beak without teeth, as I was just saying. There's a whole bunch of different types of feathers. Feathers are made out of a protein called keratin, which is the same protein we had mentioned once before related to your uh, fingernails and your hair is also made out of keratin. They have contour feathers that cover their body, and then they have these specialized flight feathers 
that are, uh, allow them to trap air and make a wind foil. They also have down feathers, and down feathers are, are totally opposite of flight feathers. They're the puffy little feathers. They're tiny with highly branched little puffs of feather, and those are designed to trap heat. And so birds that live in really cold environments utilize these down feathers for warmth. And there's a whole bunch of what we, I'll just lump them together and call them sensory feathers. You don't need to know the different names of them, but their birds have a variety of feathers on their feet and on their face that allow them to sense the environment as well. Uh, when you look at the origin of birds, birds evolved from reptiles and probably were not flying birds at first. So they were probably more gliders. And one example of that is this very famous fossil called Archaeopteryx which is part sort of reptile, part bird, and it has some reptile features and bird features. I just throw it in there to kind of give you an idea uh, that probably the first birds had feathers but weren't actually flying. In fact, we'll talk about those first, and those are penguins. So penguins are all found in the southern hemisphere. Uh, there are 18 different species, but only one of them is found uh, near the equator at all and that is uh, kind of an unusual one that is the galapagos penguin here which is critically endangered and it's found further north than any of the other penguins the other species of penguins uh, are near antarctica or somewhere near the south uh, the largest of them is the emperor penguin which stands four feet tall and can weigh 50 pounds uh, they can dive for up to 20 minutes up to 1700 feet deep and they're the only species that are actually breeding in Antarctica in the winter. Um, so in the winter in Antarctica, it can be minus 40 degrees Celsius, which is also minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Normally you've got to convert Celsius to Fahrenheit. So when I saw this, I thought something's wrong with that. Well, when you do the math, what happens is, um, the where you subtract that plus 32 on it when you get so cold there at minus 40 degrees celsius the equation sort of collapses so that both those numbers end up being uh the same which i find kind of interesting just to put that into perspective freezing is at zero degrees celsius or 32 degrees fahrenheit but Interestingly, the emperor penguin's average body temperature is 102. So it has this incredible metabolism and this incredible ability to have these down feathers. And what they do is they pack in it's so cold that they have to put the egg sitting on their feet and they have to exchange it between the two, um, between the male and female when they're taking care of this egg uh, so it doesn't freeze. So the other thing about penguins is they actually do fly, but they fly in the water. So we think of flying as a movement when you're flying through air, but water is just a different medium. It's denser. And so there is the behavior of flying, which is a characteristic sort of movement of the wings, wings and propelling themselves in a way that resembles the flight pattern movements of the wings of other birds, they consider that flying, but in a different medium. All in the Southern Hemisphere though, remember. Now, an auk is a group of birds. They're found in the Northern Hemisphere and they can fly in water and also in the air. Some similar examples that you might have seen before are the Atlantic Puffin, or maybe you've seen these razor bills here, they're the closest living relative to the great auk. The great auk, the last pair was killed by collectors in June of 1844. The, there was a pair of them actually incubating an egg and these people went over and killed them. Uh, it's just kind of crazy to me to think that people did that. But anyway, so they're an excellent example with penguins of what we call convergent evolution because two groups of birds that are unrelated to one another, but they have very similar colors and body shapes. The body plan or body style of that evolution is favored twice uh, because it works well in these really cold environments. But the ox and the penguins are really not very closely related to each other. So they did not become that way because they're related, but rather the environment shaped them that way, we think. 
Another group of ocean birds or marine birds are called petrels, or also called tube-nosed birds. Uh, those include things like the, the sooty shearwater. They migrate 40,000 miles uh, in their annual migration. It's the longest migration of any known animal that we know about. And another would be the wandering albatross, which has an 11-foot wingspan, largest of any living bird wingspan wise. Nearly all of the petrels or tube nose uh, are, are, are very highly monogamous. And what that means is you probably know there's male and female that mate quite often for life. And we always thought that birds kind of were that way, but it turns out most birds are not and most animals are not. But many uh, penguins and many of these petrels or tube nose are that way. Uh, these are pelagic feeding birds, cosmopolitan birds that travel all over the entire ocean. The last group that I'm going to mention here are called shorebirds. Collectively, we call shorebirds. Those include things like the American avocet, the long-billed curlew, uh, the black neck stilt, and this little tiny one called a sanderling here. Local ones that actually we have here in Southern California. And you can see they have all these very different beak shapes and we call that resource partitioning. We think that these birds probably evolved over time to have very different bill links and sizes and shapes to reduce competition so that they could access food that maybe others can't. So in this picture here, you can kind of see that different bill sizes. It's like a, having a, a specialized tool and some birds are better at getting certain food uh, than others. And again, these are all local birds that we would have here. There's, there's thousands of different shorebirds, uh, but these are some of our local examples. So that's the end of marine reptiles and birds. And next up, all right, so that'll be the end of marine reptiles and birds. Coming up next, we move into probably everyone's favorite, the marine mammals.